DreamWorks Animation does an excellent job of building their best movies around a theme, a universal idea that resonates with almost everyone, and then writing their story and character around it. Last time we talked about some of their excellent villains and how they work so well because they provide the negative example of the movie's theme. Today, let's explore one of those themes from the good and bad side, the weight of expectation. Who filled my head with dreams? One weak link can break the chain of a mighty dynasty. Your heart is as black as mine. First, this is such a great theme to explore and write stories around because every single one of us has experience with this. Sometimes we don't feel like we're living up to somebody else's standards. My old man is a minotaur, half man, half bull, all judgment. Sometimes we can't live down negative reputations of our past or how we look. Do I wish people didn't see us as monsters? Sure I do. What's up, Papa? But these are the cars we've been dealt. And sometimes we realize we have created false expectations for others that they could never hope to live up to. Whether your parents like it or not, I am an ogre. I hope I'm not putting too much on you, but I expect you're gonna hit that like button. <laughs> Smooth with a V. Let's kick this off with possibly my favorite DreamWorks movie, The Prince of Egypt. Honestly, it's surprising the studio continues to do well. When your second movie smashes it out of the park like this, how do you follow up? How do you keep go pack it up, fellas? We did the best we're ever gonna do. They followed it up with Road to El Dorado. Chell was out here looking thick as hell four whole years before Mrs. Incredible even existed, but everybody wants to talk about Pixar? Wait a minute, is that why I like the Goofy movie so much as a kid? Huh. I really have been consistent since childhood. But stuff like that needs to wait. We're talking about the Prince of Egypt. And first, just forget the theme for a second. The best thing about this movie is the music. I mean, we're talking banger after banger. It absolutely does not stop. The only other movie I can think of that comes close to an original soundtrack this good is The Greatest Showman. And that only loses points because of walking a tightrope. Look at me in my face. Tell me your rankings of songs from that movie doesn't have tightrope at the very bottom. The other side is on top if we're talking audio and video. If it's just audio, Come Alive is number one, obviously. Fight me in the comments. I'm trying to think of other movies that have a soundtrack this good. Am I a joke to you? Phil, I'm sorry, obviously you're on the short list. I feel like that goes without saying. But aside from the killer music, Prince of Egypt has an amazing villain, Ramses, embodying this excellent theme. From the very start, we can see it building when he and Moses are goofing around as young men and he is held to a higher standard than Moses. His father tells him that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link and he has to bear the weight of decisions for his whole country. He is an embodiment of a god. The morning and evening star, all of Egypt rests on his shoulders. That's one hell of a high bar. So it's understandable that he not only feels betrayed by Moses running away, but also he feels attacked by this Hebrew God and responds to aggression with aggression of his own. I've said in the past, I like a good old fashioned mustache twirling evil villain like Jack Horner that we saw in Puss in Boots too. However, I also like an understandable villain like Ramses. There's a huge difference between understandable and misunderstood or the soft villain we've been seeing lately. We never see an excuse for Ramses and he does doesn't get some stupid last minute redemption, and yet we can understand his villainy. As much as I love a plainly evil bad guy, there's something even more terrifying about an understandable villain, because part of us wonders what we would do in those shoes. Part of us sees Ramses and begins to be reminded of things we've said or done to meet somebody else's expectations or win their approval. I also love this idea that the good guy is a betrayer in the villain's eyes. Ramses knows nothing of God or where Moses has been for all these years. He has his own designs for Moses, that he would be a support to him, a grounding relief from the stresses of ruling. He assumed Moses would always be there, by his side, in his shadow, and so it's natural that he feels betrayed when Moses runs off. Of course, the belief that he must be a powerful ruler leads him to the grave. He is not able to let the country's slaves go. He is Pharaoh, after all. Put some respect on my name. You understand me? When y'all saying my name, put some respect on it. He's not alone, however, as Moses has expectations put on him as well. And I love how this character shows us not all of them are inherently bad. We see Pharaoh putting a weak standard on him, telling him he doesn't have much responsibility. We see him start to fulfill his role of just being the royal brother who's going to party and carouse and maybe oversee some projects. Then he has the Hebrews putting hopes on him to be their savior. 
Something in him isn't happy being a philandering prince, but the role of savior to the slaves is overwhelming. All of this, combined with the realization of what the Egyptians did to the Hebrews, catalyzed by him killing a guard, causes him to run away from everything. In Moses, we get a glimpse of many people's natural reaction to lofty goals. They flee them and their accompanying responsibility. Finally, however, we see something worth living up to, and this is important because the weight of expectation is often portrayed as a bad thing. Here we see the idea of righteousness given to Moses by God. A high supposition can break some people, even more so if it's self-serving or material or unjust, but here we see this standard inspires Moses because it is a higher idea not some job title or status symbol or impossible goal put on him by another person. And finally, he's going to have holy help and support achieving it. The elusive job title or status symbol is the ultimate downfall for our next example, Tai Lung from Kung Fu Panda. Tai Lung is an outstanding example of an understandable villain that is not excused or redeemed. I've discussed before that he was used to great effect to illustrate the main theme of the movie, which is finding your self-worth outside of external validations. In that movie, Po stops trying to be respected as a mighty warrior and discovers that he has value all by himself. And part of that value is how he can selflessly serve others in the valley by protecting them. Tai Lung never learns this lesson, even after Po tries to lay it out for him. There is no secret ingredient. just you. He's driven to murderous rage because he has been working all his life for one goal and suddenly it's taken away from him. His entire identity was wrapped up in the idea that he would be named the Dragon Warrior and would be granted the insights of the Dragon Scroll. We aren't even told he wants admiration. We don't even get told why. Specifically, he wants it so badly other than Shifu's influence, which we're getting to. It's an interesting question to wonder what he thought he would do with the scroll and the title. We ourselves are often chasing after things that other people have told us are valuable. Brennan, Dale, what kind of things are important in life? You want to be like those guys? It would not be surprising to learn that he never questioned why he wanted the scroll. It's the dragon scroll. Of course you want it. It's a Lamborghini, of course you want one. It's a huge house, of course you want one. It's a promotion, of course you should want it. She's beautiful, she's rich, she's got huge tracks of land. But we're talking about expectations and Tai Lung is only partly responsible for his life-consuming need to be the dragon warrior. The majority blame lies with his master and father figure, Shifu. This movie is just a masterpiece, honestly, on so many levels. The scene explaining Tai Lung's backstory is only a few minutes and yet we get the full breath of his obsession with becoming the dragon warrior and the obsession of Shifu to ensure that he got it. We clearly see Shifu pushing him harder and harder in a very Terrence Fletcher fashion. It's very clear that the objective they both share is more important than anything, even each other. When Ugwe finally makes his decision that Tai Lung will not be the Dragon Warrior, Shifu turns away from him almost immediately. Now that he won't be meeting Shifu's design, Shifu's initial reaction is to be done with him, showing that he never saw Tai Lung as a person or a son, really. He saw him as a goal. He saw himself as the trainer of the Dragon Warrior and also saw himself as Uwe's greatest disciple. That latter aspiration he put on himself and he clings to it when the other is no longer available. That's why he turns to follow Uwe instead of comforting Tai Lung. All right, now let me tell you something. I'm a bad father. I mean, I'm a bad father. Tai Lung also put his ambition above Shifu. Maybe it was a reaction to both teachers rejecting him, or maybe he also viewed them as goals, but whatever the case, without something else to hold on to, all the pressure on him turned into rage. Here we see multiple people creating unrealistic expectations for themselves and others. Shifu putting pressure on himself and Tai Lung. Tai Lung putting pressure on himself. Honestly, Ugwe is kind of allowing all of this to happen. Later, we see Tigress putting ambitions on herself that if she could just be good enough, she can make Shifu love her the way he loved Tai Lung. Honestly, the only winner here is the duck. 
eight. Now don't start that again. My apologies, Goose. Mr. Ping, dad of the freaking dynasty, has only expected that his son be with him in the noodle shop, and we see him quickly discard this in exchange for Poe's happiness. He isn't upset that his son is chasing his dreams. Really, he's upset that he might lose his only son. But here in the end, we see him shout, That's my boy! That big, lovely kung fu warrior is my son! In these last two examples, we've seen the weight of expectation come from an authority figure for a character. But DreamWorks doesn't just do the same thing over and over. In Shrek 2, they went to a new level and showed that not all judgments carry the same weight, and they shouldn't. The sequel picks up on the heels of the original, with Shrek and Ogre Fiona returning from their honeymoon to find a message from Fiona's parents. They've discovered that she's married her true love and they want to invite her home. They of course do not foresee two ogres getting out of the carriage, and things go sideways pretty much immediately. Side note, the two couples cutting back and forth, finishing each other's sentences, such a great scene. Throughout the movie, we see many opinions and assumptions, and the driver of the plot is that Shrek and Fiona care about everyone else's except each other's. Shrek, a rural man, suddenly in LA, is dealing with serious imposter syndrome. Fiona honestly adding to it at first, but even she is quickly disillusioned with the glitz and glam of far, far away, though it keeps putting pressure on her. Unfortunately, they aren't following the first rule of marriage club. You don't complain about your marriage to other people, especially your parents. They're also prioritizing the perspectives of other people over each other. Shrek is worried about what he thinks, Fiona thinks, the king and queen think. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. This opens their relationship up to meddling by yet another great DreamWorks villain, Fairy Freaking Godmother. I'm a savage. Yeah. Classy, bougie, ratchet. The central theme throughout the movie is that some people's sentiments aren't worth your time, and you need to prioritize what and who really matters, and that list should be tiny. Again, when we talked about Pharaoh's father, or Shifu, it's understandable that their opinion and expectation matters to their sons, but in Shrek and Fiona's case, they were fine before the big city started thrusting its notions on them, and they finally learn the lesson that it's perfectly acceptable to tell the world to go pound sand when it's intruding on your life or your marriage. And now for something completely different. Often when we talk about the weight of expectation, it's sort of an elevated aspiration that a hero or villain can't live up to. We've seen these lofty goals here already with their positive and negative effects. Something DreamWorks also handles well is the concept that some people aren't even striving to live up to an impossible standard. They're struggling because they can never live down a low one. Take this underrated classic right here, Sinbad Legend of the Seven Seas. This is a very fun movie. Sure, the plot line is a little odd, with characters transporting a glowing MacGuffin, the Book of Peace, which is just a terrible name. Sure, the backstory for the characters is very rushed. Sure, the villain has no backstory and doesn't have to make a deal with Sinbad, but does anyway, and she's feared and evil, but seems kind of powerless without the book, and her motivations aren't super clear. Sure, we... Oh, wait, where was, I... where was I going? Oh, right, right! This movie is very underrated. Look, I'm not gonna try to convince you that this is like some hidden gem, but I will tell you that it's become the undeserving butt of many jokes. It's an entertaining movie. Plus, you've got some great songs, good looking animation, and a star-studded voice cast. It doesn't deserve all the hate. I like this plot because it takes a new direction for the weight of expectations idea. Everybody thinks Sinbad will do the wrong and selfish thing, and he's not innocent in that assessment. However, when he tries to go straight, he can't live down his old reputation. The entire plot is driven by everyone, including the villain, expecting the worst of him. He has to go to great lengths, up to the point of death, to prove everyone wrong. It's a great take on how we tend to continue to judge people for their past, but also about how our decisions build momentum and reputation, and it can take extreme measures to alter people's perception of you once you've acted a certain way for enough time. DreamWorks took another swing at this idea with basically the same plot in The Bad Guys. This time they went with a twist villain who was using the bad guy's reputation against them. We also got a more nuanced approach to people's pattern of behavior and how hard it is to change. In Sinbad, the hero just decides, okay, I want to be a good guy now. But the bad guys took some time to show us the crew falling back into their old ways, partly due to how they are viewed by society, but also because they still saw themselves as bad guys. The movie also tackles this idea that the general views of society play a part in determining how we see ourselves and act accordingly. In one scene, Mr. Wolf explains that part of his path to villainy was that it was just the easiest route, since society already saw him that way because he was a wolf. He grew up with people mistrusting him, so he just began to give them what they already thought 
caught anyway. His whole crew is comprised of animals we're all leery about. Wolf, shark, snake, piranha, tarantula. They could have taken the easy route and let him get away with this blaming society for his behavior, but wisely provided a counterpoint in Diane Foxington, who is revealed to be the famous thief, the Crimson Paw. She had a change of heart, gave up the life of crime, and is now the governor, showing that using the vague idea about society holding you down is just an excuse. What this movie doesn't get enough credit for is how hard it makes Mr. Wolf work for his redemption, not just with being a good guy, but with his crew as well. His change of heart doesn't immediately redeem him with the authorities or society in general, and it doesn't change his team either. There are a lot of layers about expectations, both internal and external in this movie, but best of all is the effort that is shown in overcoming and changing them. What's your favorite theme that DreamWorks has tackled? With, you know, examples maybe. Not that I'm farming the comment section for ideas or anything. <clears throat> I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.